Welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us in the new year. 2021 is here. Uh, we're so excited to have you with us. We're so excited to have Barbara Bear with us from the Library of Congress. It's amazing. We had her with us in 2019 um, in person and now we get to share her with people nationwide, internationally. So that's an amazing update that we've had with our events. We're so pleased to be able to join you in your living room with these kinds of events. Um, as I was saying earlier, we've had many, many events. So always remember that you can check them out on our YouTube uh, and catch up with our events. So you'll see a link for that uh, that I'll paste in the chat very soon. All right, I'm gonna stop sharing. There we go. All right, so I also wanna start every single event by saying thank you so much to everyone who donates. It means so much to us. Uh, right now we're really focused on meeting our year end goals and going into the new year, our new goals. As you know, it's been a difficult year in 2020 for every type of organization. So anything you can spare really means a lot to us. Um, even something small like $5 that you might spend at Starbucks for us means so much. It also shows us that there's so many people that are enjoying all of our programming and just your presence means so much too. Just coming here tonight, joining us for these events, that means a lot too. So thank you so much for that. We really appreciate it. And in case you don't know, um, well, first of all, my name is Caitlin Shea and I'm the events and media director for the Walt Women Birthplace. And um, the Walt Women Birthplace is a museum that's located in Huntington, New York. Um, you can visit us. Uh, right now we are open. We're very happy to be open. And you can visit us for a tour of the home that Walt Women was born in 201 years ago. Um, and we love when people visit. They, if you want to learn more about Whitman, there's so much fascination, fascinating information about Whitman. Um, as you'll see here tonight, you'll hear so much about him that you probably don't know um, or you may know and want to revisit. So we'd love it if you would join us for that. And we're working on a virtual tour as well. Um, so we would love to share that with you. And I'm going to be putting all the links for our social media or maybe after this you want to find it. Um, so that you can stay updated about all of our upcoming events. We have poetry readings, we have scholarly events like we're having here tonight. And you can also just stay in touch and learn more about the birthplace um, in the future. All right, so without further ado, I would like to get started. Just give me one second to switch screens. A little bit of juggling here. There we go. Okay. And All right, so as I was saying, we're so delighted to have Barbara Bear here with us tonight. I have the pleasure of introducing her. And Barbara Bear is a curator for literature, culture, and arts in the manuscript division at the Library of Congress and a specialist for digital humanities projects. A member of the organizing committee for the 2019 Washington DC Whitman 200 Festival, Barbara was lead curator for the Whitman Bicentennial exhibit and Walt Whitman Open House public display featuring Whitman materials from throughout the library's collections. Along with the poetry program at the Folger Library, the Open House served as the finale for the citywide celebration of Whitman's birth. All right. And those of you who are big Whitman fans know that Whitman's 200th birthday was a huge celebration and Barbara did a lot to organize for that, at the Library of Congress. All right, Barbara, I'm gonna hand the spotlight over to you right now. Right. Can you hear me fine? Yes, now we can. Perfect. Okay, wonderful. Um, I just, I'm going to show you a PowerPoint presentation, so I'll take myself off video while I do that. But before I start, I just wanted to thank everyone so much for being here tonight. It feels wonderful to feel like we're all gathered together in our mutual love and interest in Whitman. So um, thank you, Caitlin and, and the birthplace. It's really um, a pleasure for me to be here. So let me see if I can share my screen. How's that? Are you seeing it? Yes. Perfect. Okay. So now I'm going to, I was going to stop my video, but the little thing went away. So. <laughs> uh, it might be at the top there, Barbara. Or it was, it kind of disappeared. Oh, wait, I keep clicking and, and um, moving. I'm sorry, everybody. No, that's fine. 
I'm sure okay. it's okay. I'll just stay on and what you'll see me um, kind of looking down and reading a little bit. So, um, so I, I'm here today to talk about the digitized Walt Whitman collection materials at the Library of Congress. And the library is still relatively new by the people crowdsourcing transcription project. By the People is an online crowdsourcing transcription platform where anyone with an internet connection can transcribe documents the library has selected from Library of Congress digitized collections. Everyone is welcome to contribute, but the project is especially geared to high school and college students, teachers, and virtual lifelong learners, or all who want to engage more closely in the library's collections. The project was conceived under the direction of Librarian of Congress, Carla Hayden, based on similar crowdsourcing transcription models at other institutions, including the National Archives and Records Administration. I was part of the Digital Humanities Stakeholders Team at the library that discussed and helped formulate the parameters of By the People in its originating stages in, in 2018. By the People is now very well established. It was a dedicated, it has a dedicated staff of community managers who oversee its many projects. They work closely with the library's learning and innovation or education outreach wing and with various affinity groups. Walt Whitman was the very first By the People campaign launched in honor of Whitman's bicentennial in 2019. Whitman was the first pancake, so to speak, but for what is now many different campaigns engaging a wide variety of collections on topics from baseball to presidents to Hispanic legal documents, the fieldwork of Alan Lomax, spiritualism, civil rights, abolition, and women's suffrage. For teaching purposes, and for those who are civil war buffs that are out there, it is good to know that the Whitman campaign is included in a larger umbrella of projects related to the Civil War. Along with letters to Lincoln, the Clara Barton papers, and collection items focused on those who served in battle or were prisoners of war. The National Council for the Teachers of English and other affinity groups dedicated to innovative ways of teaching from primary sources have embraced the Whitman campaign. Transcription and study of Whitman in his own hand is a wonderful way for students new to Whitman to engage in a very intimate way with Whitman's creative process. And Whitman's work can be combined with the work of more contemporary writers and poets in the classroom, including now the virtual classroom. NCTE president Alfredo Zeledon Lujan, for example, teaches a section of Song of Myself along with the Chicano classic, I Am Joaquin by Rodolfo Gonzalez in his high school English classes in Santa Fe, New Mexico. They look at issues like narrative voice and hybrid identity, but he also wants his students to not be afraid to revise. You can find his blog about this and a link to a webinar the library did with him and the NCTE about the Whitman campaign online through the NCTE website and that's publicly available. The name by the people comes from Lincoln's Gettysburg Address and it refers to participatory democracy and common purpose for the whole nation. And that is the spirit that infuses the project, which is first and foremost, a, a project of engagement of the nation and people of all types and from all regions in the library's materials. And people have indeed been in participating. To date, the library has released almost half a million pages of documents for transcription. The community managers are running 21 campaigns. Almost 20,000 users have registered accounts to participate in transcribing or reviewing. And as of last November, 
there have been more than a million transactions on campaign sites, or put differently, users have clicked on save or submit over a million times. Crowdsourcing is a cyclical process. You've heard of course of crowdsourcing for financial purposes, such as raising funds from many different con contributors to meet a fundraising goal. Transcription is similar. Many different people contribute to create typed versions of handwritten or printed digitized documents from library collections. The transcripts help students and others better engage with, read, and understand the documents. When the transcriptions in a project are complete, they are ingested to become part of the library's digital presentations so that users can compare the primary documents to the transcriptions for quick reading or comprehensive checks, as they can also do within By the People itself. But most importantly, so that the content of our digital humanities presentations become more word searchable and thus um, uh, accessible to a greater number of people. I want to show you some examples from the completed Whitman campaign projects and the one currently in progress and explain how the process works so that you can get involved as a volunteer and participate in the projects. And I hope you will encourage your friends, family, and students you teach to do so as well. You can also utilize the completed projects in a virtual classroom or just browse through and pick and choose for your own individual perusal and enjoyment. But first, let's backtrack a little to understand more about the content of By the People and the primary documents that have been transcribed or are being in the process of being transcribed. The Library of Congress has the largest physical collection of materials by and about Walt Whitman anywhere in the world, including rare books, first editions of Leaves of Grass, artist books, broadsides, prints, engravings, photographs, letters, diaries, drafts of poems, manuscript proof sheets, and advertising materials, musical scores set to words by Walt Whitman, and various kinds of Whitman artifacts, including a lock of his hair, one of his fountain pens, his eyeglasses, and a casting of his hand. We've shown these materials in our Walt Whitman and our Civil War exhibitions, which are available online in virtual form. It's another uh, website you can use to teach. We've loaned them to exhibits at other institutions, including museums in New York, and feature them in displays open to the public during the 200th anniversary of Whitman's birth. In these days of pandemic, when you can't see the materials on display or visit the library's reading rooms, you can see and use many of them virtually by going to the Library of Congress website. The Prints and Photographs online catalog features a myriad of visual images of Whitman and also people and places associated with him. For documents to be included in the By the People campaign, they first have to be already digitized and available in some form online. In the manuscript division, which is where I work in the library, we have digitized three Walt Whitman collections. You can find these collections by going to the library's homepage, which is what you see on the screen at loc.gov. And you can click on either the digital collections or the researchers tabs that show below the main visual image on the screen. From the researchers page, you can find the Walt Whitman resource guide. This was created by my friend and colleague, Peter Armenti. And it has links to our digitized collections and also to other Whitman resources available on the library's website. From the digital collections page, you can find the three digitized manuscript collections, which in total include more than 30,000 items. The two collections involved in By the People so far are the Whitman Miscellaneous Manuscript Collection, which has been transcribed in full. We consider it completed. 
and the Charles Feinberg collection of Walt Whitman papers, which we are doing in separate projects or sections over time. These include the poetry section of the literary file. And what you're looking at here is the finding aid for the Feinberg collection. If you're a librarian, you're, you are familiar with finding aids um, or if you've done research in a reading room, but you can see there are these links to digital content available. So one easy way to look at documents is to pretend that you are going through a box and you're looking folder by folder and clicking on those digital content available links. We're also doing the prose section of the literary file, and that's the one that's open now and that you could contribute to. So I'm hoping that people will volunteer soon and help us with that. We will be launching two brand new projects soon in 2021 of Whitman's speeches and Whitman's diaries and notebooks from the fine book papers. Before we look at some examples from By the People I want to talk a little about transcription and related resources. Like professional art and amateur and folk art and other popular forms of art, there are different standards and criteria for professional or scholarly transcription and crowdsourcing transcription. While professional transcription is a painstaking and precise pro process of translating, proofreading and verifying handwritten written or annotated printed documents into transcribed form, often with annotations added, and usually undertaken by scholars, professional editors, and graduate students. Crowdsourcing is more basic in its approach. You can see the gold standard of Walt Whitman transcription in the Walt Whitman archive which includes Whitman documents from different repositories and collections from all over the world and not just the Library of Congress. We refer to the Whitman archive as an expert resource in our By the People's website. And the archive is one of the affinity groups. The library consults in deciding which parts of our Whitman collections to prioritize for transcription. Another wonderful new example of transcription as an art form is the new book, Every Hour, Every Atom, a collection of Walt Whitman's early notebooks and fragments edited by Zachary Turpin and Matt Miller. This includes notebooks from the library's Feinberg and Harned collections and, and also materials from other repositories. It is a great read and I recommend it as a nightstand material as well as for scholarly use. Turpin and Miller talked about their joy and collaboration in creating the book in a Whitman initiative program last fall. And we hope to bring that same kind of joy to a broad group of people through our crowdsourcing campaign. These images give you an idea of what an original document looks like on the cover of, of, um, of Zach and Matt's book and the way in which they have done their very literal transcriptions. They spell out their transcription methodology in a key for readers at the front of their book. So this is a good reference to use, especially if you're teaching transcription. For our crowdsourcing, the transcription method is stripped down to basics. The goal being getting the words on the page that will aid in understanding when compared to the documents, streamlining the time it takes to produce the transcriptions and sharing the labor to do so best serving the ultimate goal of the group produced product, which is when the transcripts are uploaded to our digital humanities presentations to make them more searchable and thus expand their use. Okay, let's look at the Whitman crowdsourcing projects. It is not necessary to register to participate in By the People, but I recommend it. Registration allows you to not only transcribe, but to tag and participate in the review or final proofreading phase of the project. It's very easy to register and just takes a few moments. You create your own password. 
and there is a welcome guide and a page explaining how to transcribe. You can read and tag in the projects even after the transcription has been completed. And I recommend the completed projects for use by teachers for as student assignments. All the documents in the Walt Whitman Miscellaneous Manuscript Collection are transcribed, but they have not yet been uploaded to the Digital Humanities presentation site. You can view all the transcriptions though, just by going into By the People. The Miscellaneous Manuscript Collection is famous because it contains rare primary materials related to Whitman and his family and life in Long Island including a group of letters from Whitman to his friend Abraham Leach, written when Whitman was teaching in rural schools. The letters are good examples of Whitman's disarming use of vernacular. You can see here, he says, how do you do? Quite a hankering. We can also see here in the document and the transcription that Whitman offers a kind of benediction to his friend. May your kind angel hover to the invisible in the invisible air and lose sight of your blessed presence never. We could all use such a blessing in this time of pandemic. And this passage always reminds me of Lincoln referring to the better angels of our nature. You can see how the screen is set up and by the people where you see the digitized document on the left and you type in or view the transcription on the right. After the transcription is saved and passes through review, it is marked as completed. You can still add tags, such as the one you see here, identifying the full name of Abraham Leach. There's also correspondence in the collection that is not to or by Whitman, but to other members of the family. Here his young niece is writing to her grandmother, Whitman's mother, Louisa. Teachers can use family letters to talk with students about how families communicate today or to do more research in Whitman's family tree and or have students um, look into their own family trees by interviewing their family members. Hattie's letters are also about coping in the aftermath of the loss from a death in the family, her mother, which unfortunately is something more and more people relate to or fear in this time of pandemic. The poetry project of the Whitman campaign is taken from a section of the Feinberg Whitman collection. It is also completed. It contains many little fragments or thoughts about poems, trial lines and working drafts of poems. It is a great resource to use to compare how early versions or ideas and word and image choices developed into the later finished published product and to discuss with students the process of drafting and revising in their own writing and how a poem is a very dynamic and changing thing. Here, Whitman works on by day, this distant shadowy sails in which we can easily imagine him at the shore looking out to the water. Students can study his use of imagery and also find and compare it to other Whitman poems published about the sea or sailing such as passages from Leaves of Grass or Out of the Cradle Endlessly Rocking. He also uses the theme of passage and of the birds flying overhead and crossing Brooklyn Ferry and the trial lines for that poem are available to see in a notebook in the library's digitized collections. Bird imagery is also important here as in other Whitman poems and a study unit could focus on which birds Whitman wrote about and what they symbolize. And the connection to transcendence and spirituality, the ship, the planets, the soul, all in passage, and a vast soul manifested in the movements of the universe. In studying this document, you can also use the zoom feature to enlarge the image to look more closely and examine the materiality of the document. How did he create this physically? You can see here that Whitman switched from pen to pencil. And what's this he's writing on? The next image shows you that it's an envelope from a letter he received in Camden that he has slid open in order to write on the blank part inside. 
a saving paper. The address and postmarks also help us to date this fragment. Whitman's habit of writing on any available scrap, be it a ticket stub, an envelope, or the back of a piece of letterhead stationery that was intended for some other purpose, and also his habit of cutting and pasting available paper together as he works on drafts of documents is one of my favorite things to use to engage students. They can hunt for what's on the other side by going through our digital sites and then report on the meanings they glean from the sometimes very different recto and verso of a document. Or they can make collages of their own out of reuse documents that they choose and share with one another what they write on the other side. Not all the documents we're asking volunteers to transcribe are handwritten. They might be printed or be printed with handwritten annotations and additions, printing directions or editorial changes. Again, the ultimate goal of crowdsourcing transcription is to get the words on the page for uploading to make the documents, even the fully printed ones, more searchable. I've used this document, Going Somewhere, with students to talk about Whitman's close friendships with women, here in particular with the British intellectual Anne Gilchrist. The poem can also be used to discuss Whitman's metaphysical outlook in his poems. Here, his positivism, his desire to believe it all amounts to something, and we are all going somewhere, and that humans are part of a much larger and hopefully improving process of betterment. Anne Gilchrist wrote a key critical analysis of Lees of Grass, and her home was a haven for Whitman in the time she lived in Philadelphia and he in Camden. Students can read this poem which is Whitman's estimate of Gilchrist, and also Gilchrist's published essay, A Woman's Estimate of Walt Whitman. It was published in Boston in 1870, and a transcription of it is available online in the Walt Whitman archive. You can also look at correspondence with the Gilchrist family in our Feinberg digital presentation. One of my favorite lines from A Woman's Estimate is, quote, I had not dreamed that words could cease to be words and become electric streams like these, end quote. Gilchrist stressed the extraordinary vitality of Whitman's poetry, the reliance on science, its deep musicality, and its sensuality. This tribute by Whitman to Gilchrist can also be used as the base to study the connections of Whitman to intellectuals in Britain including Gilchrist and William Michael Rossetti, who helped popularize Leaves of Grass in England and support Whitman in times of censorship in the United States when he had financial difficulties. In this 1871 letter to Gilchrist, Whitman praises her understanding of Leaves of Grass into which he has poured his body and spirit. And he says, my book is my best letter. He is hedging here at the beginning of their friendship to encourage her to think in terms not of a personal relationship between the two of them, but of a relationship with his work. The draft letter to Gilchrist, I cannot resist pointing out, is written on the back of pieces of page proofs for after all not to create only. So this is another example of an exercise in what's on the other side. Long, long, long has the grass been growing. Long and long has the rain been falling. Long has the globe been rolling round. This is another by the people example. Despite what Whitman says, this is a rather bleak poem about death, which was published after Whitman's own passing and in which he refers to seeing the suffering of Union soldiers hospitalized in the war and the deaths of innocents. I use it as an example here, partly because of the art history aspect and to show you that you can find some perhaps unexpected visual images of Whitman embedded in the by the people materials. And then you can use those in interdisciplinary ways. 
Here students could compare the Alexander sketch to other images of Whitman available in the library's prints and photographs online catalog, including images of his burial site, or read the passage from the Bible and look at the George Ennis painting that inspired this poem. It's possible to use the by the people transcriptions to look at questions of class and race in Whitman's writings, either in a critical way regarding his use of outmoded descriptors now deemed insensitive or racist. An example here is the term woolly head or his figuring of Native Americans and African Americans as others, but also in a positive way regarding hybridity and power relations and Whitman as an observer of the parade of common life, his continual pluralistic and indeed biblical embrace of those who are outcast, laboring, diseased, or who occupy conditions of stigma, servitude and caste as worthy and soul possessing beings, including here in this example, the effeminate male, their runaway teenager, the beggar out of work, the couple eloping to marry on their own. He does not make elites his subject matter. And here he declares, as you can see at the end of the transcript, none but are accepted, none but are dear to me. I want to end the poetry examples with this one, which has become so incredibly timing, timely for our masked selves in this pandemic out from behind this mask, this common curtain of the face and the soul's geography's map, all of us hidden behind our coverings and like planets orbiting in the universe. This is the draft poem from which I base the title for this evening's talk, to you, whoever you are. Whitman's astronomy references to the sun and moon, Jupiter, Venus, Mars, also carries extra weight for us, just having recently witnessed the rare conjunction of Jupiter and Saturn. And poems like these are ways to connect English and STEM lessons in classrooms. Our latest project and the one that's still open for participation right now is our prose project in the Whitman campaign. It's currently in progress and rapidly coming to completion. I hope some, some of you will sign up soon and contribute to the review part of the process if you haven't already. And this project is also drawn from the uh, Walt Whitman Feinberg collection. There are prose pieces that can be used by teachers in connection with Whitman documents and the other projects of the Whitman campaign. For example, combining study of Whitman's story, Death in a Schoolroom, with his letters to Abraham Leach that we looked at earlier. The prose piece deals with the topic of abuse and school reform, education reform. Much as Whitman tackled the subjects of poverty or temperance in other writings. This document also shows how Whitman's work was picked up and published by various newspapers. And this is how many people um, in the public encountered Whitman and may not have even um, you know, well, at this point, they wouldn't have known because he hadn't published Leaves of Grass uh, yet. But later, even sometimes people didn't connect the prose writer and the poet. The publication of Whitman prose in newspapers and his making a living as a freelance writer is a whole topic for students and scholars that is popular. And it's greatly aided now by the existence of newspaper or electronic databases. Whitman's freelance work is also reflected in this drafted ad for his Manly Health and Training series that was published in the New York Atlas in 1858. Are these notes on the reverse for characters and plot line for a tale of Antoinette? The notes to self you'll see sort of towards the bottom in the middle with the manacles pointing to them. Movement, dialogue, incident. These words can be used as prompts by creative writing teachers working with students who are 
um, asked to develop outlines for their own fiction stories. There are descriptions of his visits to Civil War hospitals, which can be used by students in comparison to his published accounts of his time in the wards, like memoranda during the war, or to other Civil War materials on the library's website. So you could use this in combination with different kinds of, of um, primary sources, like letters to Lincoln or the Clara Barton papers. Here he is describing small necessities and food items he brought in his haversack to improve the mood and well-being of the wounded, acting like a kind of Santa figure with his sack and as a surrogate family member to patients whose families were far away. And this is another aspect that we can again closely identify with in times of COVID when families cannot be with loved ones in hospitals. We return here to the nautical theme we started with and consideration of Whitman as a lover of words and an expert wordsmith. Here he writes down terms and definitions of sailing and the sea, which read in a highly poetical way. This can be used in a student exercise about developing vocabulary and understanding synonyms or making word lists to aid in the crafting of your own poetry. I hope that those of you here tonight will sign up to help with the next project, Whitman's Speeches, which is going to come in April 2021. That project will include Whitman's copy of his oration on the death of Lincoln and other items, which we plan to make available around the time that Whitman would have traditionally given the Lincoln oration, which is on or near the anniversary of Lincoln's assassination. We hope to finish that project, which is relatively small, by Whitman's birthday at the end of May. Completing the speeches will serve as a challenge towards starting Whitman's notebooks and diaries from the Feinberg collection, which will be up longer and we anticipate will last through the summer. So if you're, you are teaching summer school or a student looking for a project in, in the summer, the notebooks and diaries should be available. And again, um, Turpin and Miller's book is a really good book to compare to um, what we have in primary source when we start that project. You can ask by the people, community managers and librarians questions about crowdsourcing and the various campaigns, including Whitman, through the History Hub interface, a link to which is available on the By the People website. Okay, good. That's it. Barbara, thank you so much. That was so fascinating. I just, I love the parts where he's using both sides of the paper and everything. It's just, it's such a great look into Whitman that you gave us. So if everyone could unmute for a moment so we can give Barbara a big, well-deserved round of applause. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much. And uh, we're ready to take questions. Um, so if you want to start putting them in the chat, or you could actually just jump on camera if you want to unmute right now and um, ask any of your questions, that would be great too. Question. Um, I never knew about the aff affiliation, um, association, pardon me, uh, with Clara Barton until I saw a photo of Clara um, helping Walt Whitman. So I'm interested, she was always my hero. Um, so I'm really interested in, um, knowing a little more about their friendship, their, um, I mean, apparently they, they wrote back and forth to each other. Um, you mentioned- um, Not that I know of, it's very interesting. Um, they worked in the same building um, in doing clerical work for the government at slightly different times. And her office of missing soldiers was right down the street. But as far as I know, they did not know each other but they overlap. They were sometimes in the same places. So I'd be very interested what the photo was that you saw. Maybe there's been some new evidence that they did meet. Um, when he very first goes to Washington DC from New York during the, you know, the early part of the Civil War, he's looking for his brother, George. And George has been wounded. He knows he's been wounded. He saw his name listed in the newspaper, which is why he was motivated to go to search for him. And um, he eventually finds him um, 
uh, in Virginia. And Claire Barton was also working at there, um, giving care to the wounded at the time. But, and he gives descriptions of the house where the wounded were um, carried in and treated. And um, he ends up staying there and then, you know, uh, eventually uh, settling for the rest of the war in Washington, DC. But I don't personally know of evidence that they knew one another. But we do have a separate Clara Barton papers collection, which is very large and wonderful. And it includes her correspondence to all kinds of people. And also one of the wonderful things in it is that after the war to raise money um, for missing soldiers, she gave lectures and we have her kind of handmade um, uh, prompt cards. They're the, they're, they're, they're the 19th century version of a teleprompter that they're written really large so that she could use them as her lecture notes. And those are really fascinating. Oh, but the Clara Barton papers are another project that's up and by the people. So you can look at those separate from the Whitman material. Thank you. Wonderful. Oh, that's really interesting. Yeah, so there's other writers that are on the crowdsourcing uh, the website yes. as well. Okay. Yes. Yeah, so Whitman was the first campaign, but since then we've added 20 other ones and Clara Barton is one of them. Um, the Blackwell family, uh, we, we did um, various organizations for, that were involved in the suffrage movement because of the recent anniversary of the passage of the 19th Amendment. You know, sometimes the things that we do are anniversary driven because uh, uh, there's a lot of public interest at that time, but also teachers are covering that topic in their classes and they need the material. So that's one of the criteria of how we decide what to put up. I don't know if you can hear the sirens going by outside. Um, I am in Washington, DC. We have a lot of emergency vehicles moving around. So I apologize. That's I fascinating that you're very busy at work there at the Library of Congress. It sounds like it's getting all of these materials out to the public. It's amazing. And you know, it's all about engagement, um, and it's also about engagement of our staff. It, you know, it, you never know when you plan something how things will work out. But of course, none of us foresaw that the pandemic would happen, that the library would be closed. You know, all these unprecedented things. So it turned out to be incredibly lucky that we had started this digital humanities project that everyone could contribute to because it's something everybody can do from home. And you can also kind of organize transcribathons, like get together a group of people. When we first started, we did these physically, like people would all come to a room with their laptops and a cup of coffee and, and work on the transcripts together. Or in the beginning, I went to some classes physically and you know we, we would transcribe together with uh, you know everybody in the class kind of calling out what they saw and working on the transcript and refining it together, which was wonderful exercise but you can do that virtually too mm -hmm. and of course you know people who are alone can also really enjoy this and go in and do it just for their own pleasure and you know to learn more about Walt Whitman but the other thing about engagement of staff is you know basically anybody in the library can, can propose a project so people you know can um, think about what they have in their collections that would make something good a wonderful new one that we have up that's really fun is from the Rare Book and Special Collections Division that is um, the notebooks of a spiritualist that happened to be in um, the Houdini collection. So we launched that for Halloween in, uh, and that was very appropriate. But staff have also been um, unexpectedly contributing to by the people because they're teleworking for home and they needed the work. Um, and so one of the ways we engaged uh, was to bring in staff members that maybe are technical workers or clerical workers that weren't able to go into the library, but they could contribute to this campaign. And so they're also transcribing the way everybody else out in the nation is doing. And we had a huge push of, you know, incredible numbers because in March, April, May, June, because of that. And we actually have launched some things like um, Patton um, that was just a staff only project that 
So we're seeing to the needs of our own employees as well as you know everybody else. Wow. Yeah, it sounds like a, Yeah. I had a question um, off the top of your head. You know whether there are materials in um, the by the people Whitman collections that have to do with the Long Islander newspaper, or is that something that could be searchable through things that have yet to be transcribed? It would be easy to look if you remember how I mentioned that one of the easy ways to tell about the content is to look in the finding aid for the collection. Right. And those are searchable. So, uh, for, you know, for the title of things. So if there is a long line or endure piece, it would be, it would, should come up in a search. Um, okay. So that's one way to look um, or just to, you know, look through the pros section. There are various, I can't off the head of, the top of my head think of a Long Islander item, but there are various items from different newspapers of the time that are fairly rare, where we either had a clipping that he saved or sometimes he saved the whole issue. Yeah, so, there were some, yeah, there were some uh, letters that went back and forth with the uh, editors, Charles and um, George Shepard. Mm -hmm. but, but the letters, as far as I know, are not, um, they haven't been found, they're lost. Oh. But there were letters, there have been references to letters, but not the letters. Well, we can, look, we can look forward to somebody hopefully finding those in an attic or something. That would Wouldn't be, that be cool. wonderful? It would be terrific. Sometimes, I mean, the Abraham Leach letters, nobody, you know, those were found in the 80s and, you know, no one had imagined that mm -hmm. this kind of material, you know, was still out there. So we, you never know what can be found. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Martha. I see that you have our Whitman at 200 birthday. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> super fan. Thank you. Barbara? Um, yes. Would you be willing to run a brief um, seminar instruction if people wanted to try the transcribing? I would, and even better than me would be one of our really marvelous um, community managers because they do this all the time. And um, they've worked a lot with our teachers. So I could do it or one of them could do it. So yes, we'd be really happy to do that. Thank you. Caitlin, can we make it so? Yeah, I love it. <laughs> Great program, thank you. Lori is one of our wonderful volunteers at the birthplace. Because you know, if we're gonna jump in, I'd rather jump in with a little bit of training. Well, I wanna encourage you to look at the website because we do have the welcome guide and the how to transcribe guide, and it's really simple. So I, I think you can dive right in and understand it. Um, so, and then you can always email us and say, I, I'm not quite sure what to do here and we can help. Thank you. So, the other thing about it is that maybe I didn't make very clear is that many different people can work on the same document. They can't be in it at the same time, but it's possible that someone could start a document and someone else could work on it and someone else could work on it, especially for long things. So it's almost like a dialogue taking place that you may see something, someone else may see something different. And then in the review process, someone is, uh, People have basically said, I think I'm all done with this transcript. It, I think it's satisfactory and I'm saving it. The review part, someone else looks at it. It's always a different person than the person who transcribed. And one of the things I'd like to do is recruit more reviewers because that's a really important part of the process. That's like making sure that people read things correctly or got people's names right. And sometimes when you have expertise, like, you know, someone said they're, uh, you know, very interested in Clara Barton, um, or you may know a lot about Long Island history, you would be knowledgeable about things that maybe the person who did the transcription didn't know, and they were kind of guessing, well, this name looks like it's this to me, but you might know that that's George Sherling or you know, whatever the name is. So the reviewing process is really important. In the beginning, I was doing the review and then um, we've realized as these things have grown that it will be impossible for the historians to go in and look at every document. So 
there's been a decision that, uh, you know, it's more important to do it imperfectly and get it up and have it work in terms of a search engine than to have all these transcripts be as perfect as we might like them to be. But so be easy on yourself about the expectations and just enjoy doing it. So it's not a Google Doc. In other words, no. if I start it, then Caitlin comes in, it doesn't overwrite. No. And you can save where you are and someone else can, can come in and work on it, yeah. I should tell her when you go there and you start doing this, time will pass very quickly. You'll just find yourself going to the next one and the next one. I mean, it's a little bit of an addictive process, it really is. Well, it's, it's it is a little bit like a, a video game, I have to say. It, it you know, it, it's a challenge, and you want to you finish a page, you want to do another page, and yeah, that's really true. Yeah, it can be a little addictive. Yes, definitely. Um, we also have some questions in the chat that I want to share. Oh. Uh, a question from Sheila Fox. And Sheila says, what happens when there is a strong disagreement about how a transcription should be written? The reviewer makes a decision. And um, the there, as I mentioned, we the project does have community managers and they will look at this too. And some of these issues are just, you can discuss them on the history hub that I showed the, near the end of the presentation. That's basically a group chat um, kind of area where you can ask a question or people can say, I'm working on this and I see this issue and someone else can respond to it. So there's a way to have a dialogue about something that you see as problematic. Um, we've also addressed the issue of if you've, come across something that you're transcribing that you personally feel uncomfortable about. Um, the, you know, the recommendation is uh, to just you know, stop and work on another document. Um, Interesting, yeah. So there's multiple people working on it. So hopefully together. Right. Correctly. Um, right. We're, we're respectful of that feeling, but you know the idea is that well, then there are many other things that you would enjoy doing. So just shift over to that other item. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> um, and we have a comment from Ed Santino, and Ed was with us a few years ago. He had an exhibit at the birthplace uh, with Whitman marketing materials that he was showing. Really fascinating. Yeah. And um, Ed is wondering, do you accept download from private collectors? Interesting. Um, we do um, do born digital collecting at the library. So um, Ed, if you would email me privately about what you have and what you'd like to suggest, I, I'd be very happy to have a conversation with you about it. Yes. So I started meeting through the birthplace this way. You actually, I was just thinking you could even have a program together or something because you both have different aspects of women that you could bring together. That would be fun. I just timed out, so I'm signing back in. I don't know if you can still see me, but. Oh yes, we can see you. Okay. I, I have to um, log back into my computer. Okay. Take your time, we can hear you. If, if, I, don't if I don't touch it, um, it, it, yeah. it closes itself, yeah. Okay, gotcha. um, and then we have. Okay, I'm back. <laughs> okay. Uh, we have Catherine Waitnes with us who uh, presented during our 2019 International Women Conference, actually. Good to see you, Catherine. And Catherine says, in addition to the Library of Congress How to Transcribe Guide, the Whitman Archive has a great guide to Whitman's handwriting with samples of each letter of the alphabet. Yes. Sounds and that I think that's in the In Whitman's Hand section of the Whitman Archive website, and it's really terrific. Yes, it, it can. If you look at women's writing, sometimes you can feel the rushing and the, how he wants to get it out so quickly. So it can be difficult to. Uh... That, that's another thing about those early letters um, versus you know some of the things he wrote later, like the issue of how his handwriting changes. Hmm. Well, that's interesting. And uh, we have a question from Jamie Silver. You wanna, yeah, go I, ahead. First of all, thank you for opening up an entire new world for me. I had no idea any of this existed. Uh, so my mind is really, no. uh, thank you so much. Oh, thank you. I'm so happy. Thank you for telling me. Yeah, I, I have my, this little 
Walt Whitman, Leaves of Glass. It goes with me. I, like It's my favorite book. I adore him. But I have a question um, uh, that's kind of on an unrelated subject, but hopefully maybe somebody here might have the answer. My father died last weekend, and he has an extensive collection in Asheville, North Carolina, mm -hmm of history books of all kind that he like lovingly underlined and annotated. And it's just like, it's just a treasure. And I'm wondering if there's any place that you might know of that would want to maybe take the whole collection. His wife doesn't want any of it. Or if this is just a crazy notion of mine. No, I think that you will be able to find somewhere and thank you so much for being a good steward of his material. And I'm sorry to hear about your loss. Um, I would maybe start with the University of North Carolina and okay. um, or, or Duke University and, and just tell them what you have, the topics of the books. And um, what they often do is, you know, they will see if they already have the titles in their library or if they are about a theme where they maybe that's a priority for them in collecting. Um, and if they don't want to have them, they may very well be able to direct you to somewhere else. So, you know, you just start a, like a chain of, of um, conversation. And we always try to do that with the library that if it's not right for us, we try to think of somewhere else you can ask. So, but um, I, I think you will be able to find somewhere that would take them all. Thank you. I think you're in. Yeah. There's a lot of fascinating stories about people finding things in attics and, you know, them surfacing at museums and being interesting to so many people. So it's great that you want to share that with a lot of people. Um, then we have a question from Nancy Servin. Uh, Nancy says, hi, I am a student that is going to do a transcription as a senior project. And I was wondering how I would be able to see what I did on my own versus what someone else did if multiple people are working on the same piece? Oh, that's a very interesting question. And I was... I, I mean, it's very highly likely that if you start on something and you're signed into it and you just finish the whole thing, you will know that you did that whole piece. And then what you would see is how somebody reviewed it. Like if they just accepted it the way you did it or if they made any changes. And um, the other way to do it is to transcribe it yourself and copy it and keep a copy of your own and then you know compare with any changes that are made. Uh, did you have an idea what document you wanted to do? Were you thinking of a particular piece or are you still going to uh, take a look to decide? Yeah, I'm still going to take a look and decide. Okay. And well, thank you for answering the question. Sure, and you know, the other thing, one reason why we put the Whitman Archive as a you know, very strongly recommended reference source, uh, you, you know, some, many of the things we're asking to people to, to transcribe new have already been transcribed by the Whitman archive. So that's another way to look is to do it yourself and then see how they did it. And then learn, learn how the, those professional editors decided to handle certain situations that you might see in a, a letter or a, um, one of the articles. Barbara, I have a question if, if I could. Oh, hi there. <laughs> I know you. <laughs> Kind <laughs> comments about the Whitman Archive. I appreciate that. Um, as you're talking, I'm I find myself curious. Uh, when various people transcribe a document, are you um, do they get named in the ultimate transcription? Are they credited in a note or anything like that? I I know that you do that in the Whitman Archive, and I've always really appreciated that you list the people that worked on that transcription. And we don't do that partly because we want people to feel anonymous and not self-conscious, or that their privacy is not invaded. So we we are not doing that. Okay. Do we have anyone else who wants to jump in with any questions or comments? Give me a second. And we have a lot of great comments in the uh, chat, Barbara. 
I'm going to make sure you. Get I haven't that. looked. Should yeah. I? Should I open my chat? Well, I'll send it to you so you can see. Oh, okay. All. Okay. Yeah. Great. Um, but I, obviously, everyone really enjoyed this. We got such an in-depth look at Whitman this way, and we have an adventure ahead of us <laughs> to go on there. Like I was saying, it's going to turn into hours before you know it, <laughs> as soon as you start. But um, so thank you so much, Barbara. We really appreciate it. We love that we could connect with you like this from Washington. Um, and you could share this with us and everyone has access, which is a beautiful thing, virtual programs like this. So thank yes, you. Thank so you so much. much. And uh, give by the people a try and have fun with it. Yeah, it's all about the fun for sure.